Red Hot Chili Peppers dropped their fifth record, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, in September of 1991. Rick Rubin produced the album, which is a departure from their 1989 record, Mother's Milk. It had toned down the metal riffs that gave Frushanti's melodic songwriting more space. And the album delves into some pretty dark stuff, with drug references, lots of sex, and some good death references thrown as well. Like, subscribe, thank you. But it's all balanced with a wild and energetic vibe. The album was a huge hit, shooting the band to fame and earning them tons of praise from critics worldwide. John Frusciante would end up bailing on the band in 1992, right in the middle of the tour that was supporting this album. He was just having a hard time dealing with all the fame that came with it. But he would end up returning in 1998, the Blood Sugar Sex Magic, released in 91, is considered the landmark album of the 90s. And it turned out to be their second best-selling record, coming in behind Californication. Prior to that, Mother's Milk, which had come out in 89, actually hit number 52 on the charts. And that was their highest position at the time. So that album actually did okay, but the band really wasn't digging their producer, Michael Beanhorn. Michael had told John Frusciante to play heavier guitar and Anthony Kiedis to write more radio-friendly lyrics, and so the band failed really stifled creatively. So when their deal with EMI Records expired, the band started shopping around for a new label, and they had originally decided to go with Epic Records, but they had made them actually buy back their last album from EMI. They said it would be done in a couple days, but it ended up taking months. And even though a deal with Epic was already in place, Warner Brothers Records' head honcho, Mo Austin, actually reached out to Anthony Kiedis to give him props on the deal and even given their rival record label props as well for signing them up. And that stuck out in Anthony's mind. He said that the guy was the coolest, most genuine person they had met during all these negotiations. And it was right then and there that Anthony decided that they should actually go with Warner Brothers. And this turned out to actually be a great move on their part. Mo Austin was pretty influential, so he was able to call in a couple favors over at EMI, and the deal was sealed. So after signing with Warner, the Chili Peppers started searching for a producer to work with. Enter Rick Rubin, a producer who was a lot more open-minded than anybody that the band had worked with before. So he proved to be a standout right from the beginning. And what's interesting is that the band had actually approached him back in 87 for the Uplift Mojo Party Plan album, but Anthony and their guitar player at the time... Hilla Slovak were both deep into the drugs. Slovak ended up actually dying from a heroin overdose only a year after that. And Rick Rubin just didn't want anything to do with them. But now things had changed, and so Rick entered the fold. And the guys in the Chili Peppers really trusted him. They felt comfortable asking for help when things would get tough. And he was always there to help them out with guitar melodies, drum beats, lyrics, or whatever. And for this album, they didn't want to record it in a traditional recording studio. They wanted to try something new. And so Rick Rubin actually pitched the idea of visiting the mansion where Harry Houdini supposedly had lived. And so the group all went for it. They brought in a crew to build a recording studio and get all the stuff they needed for production. And so they planned on holing up in this Los Angeles mansion while recording. But Chad Smith was not into staying there at all. He was completely freaked out, saying the place was haunted. So instead, he'd just show up on his motorcycle every single day. And John Frusciante didn't see eye to eye with Smith on the ghosts in the house. He said that they were definitely there, but insisted that there were really friendly ghosts, bringing good vibes and happy times whenever they entered the house. So John, Anthony, and Flea each got their own rooms in the house. And when John Frusciante wasn't in the studio with the band, he would chill out by painting, listening to tunes, reading, or laying down some tracks of his own. And since they were holed up in the house, Anthony Kiedis recorded all his vocals in his room, which was actually big enough for the recording gear. So the Red Hot Chili Peppers hunkered down in the house for over a month, and Anthony Kiedis thought it was a pretty good place to finish writing his lyrics. But while making the album, the band actually let Flea's brother-in-law film their creative process, and that resulted in a little film called Funky Monks, named after one of the tracks on the album. They cranked out Blood Sugar's Sex Magic a lot faster than their last record, before the Chili Peppers moved into that big house, John Frusciante and Anthony Kiedis were hanging out at each other's places, working out song structures and guitar parts. Then they would pitch their ideas to Flea and Chad Smith, and together they ended up settling on the instruments they'd use. So Rick Rubin asked for a song, where he had asked them, Hey, can you write a song but only about chicks and cars? And so they ended up coming up with a greeting song, but Anthony Kiedis hated it. He obliged, but he just couldn't stand anything about the lyrics whatsoever. Anthony's direction was more about writing songs about 
the pain and self-destructive thoughts that were tied with his addiction to heroin and cocaine. When he was living under a bridge in downtown L.A., he felt that his life was at its absolute worst. And he had actually come up with a poem, and Rick Rubin had come across this in the house. And that poem actually turned out to be the lyrics for Under the Bridge. He thought Anthony Kiedis should show it to the rest of the band. And Anthony was worried because he was thinking that the lyrics were way too mellow and just didn't fit their style. But then after singing a verse to Chad Smith and John Frusciante, the band actually got to work on the structure. Rick Rubin and Anthony spent hours tweaking the song's chords and melodies until they were both happy with it. And John Frusciante took an interesting approach. He had picked the intro chords to counter the song's dark vibe, saying that his brain thought the song was super sad, so he figured if the lyrics are that sad, he should write some happier chords to counterbalance that. So one of the first songs they wrote was Naked in the Rain, and that one definitely sounds like classic Chili Peppers. Hard rocking funkiness all the way. Sounding something like something that would fit perfectly on their previous album, Mother's Milk. But it pops out a lot more with that Rick Rubin production. And that's the thing about the production on this album is that it's actually timeless. It doesn't sound dated. So during the end of their 1990 Mother's Milk tour, they had actually teased out some of the intros for the greeting song, Sir Psycho Sexy, a couple others that were actually on the album. But at the time, none of the songs were finished or had any lyrics. But the group really swung for the fences, experimenting with more melodic songs. And some of their more hard-rocking numbers on the album actually had a lot more space and depth to them than stuff on Mother's Milk. Songs like Give It Away, the title track Blood Sugar Sex Magic, and Funky Monks, as well as Suck My Kiss, kind of hit different shades of clean and dirty with the guitar. And musically, they were just on another level from what they did previously. Flea wasn't slapping as crazy as he was on their previous work, and instead really just kind of digging in the groove and locking in really tight with Chad's drumming. Flea took on a less is more approach, saying that he wanted to simplify his playing because he had been overplaying before. Figured he needed to chill out. And basically, the less you play, the more exciting it gets because this way there's more space for everything. Breaking the Girl had some really interesting vibes to it. 6-8 time signature, really deep vocal melodies, kind of reminiscent of something like Friends from Led Zeppelin, but with more of an updated feel to it. And lyrically, it was about Anthony Kiedis' ever-changing love life at that point. He was worrying that he was turning into his dad, just a womanizer, not someone who could have a real, lasting relationship. And basically, he had summed it up, saying that as exciting as it gets with all the girls, at the end of the day, it's just really lonely and you end up left with nothing. And they also came up with their own percussion instruments from stuff that they had pulled together from the local dump for the bridge section. The Chili Peppers were really into building their songs up from jams, but with this album in particular, they're taking more of a structured approach to songwriting, and it would definitely pay off. But one of the songs that was born from a bit of a jam was when Anthony was watching John Frusciante and Flea and Chad Smith totally jamming out on a groove with this crazy bass line that Flea was doing. And so he just grabbed the mic and started singing, give it away, give it away, give it away now. And it stuck. And the lyrics were actually inspired by a chat that he had had with Nina Hagen about selflessness and how material stuff wasn't that important to him. And the song My Lovely Man lyrically was about their late guitarist, Hillel Slovak, Musically, the song hits really hard, and it also signals this direction that the Chili Peppers would take on later songs like Tell Me Baby, which is this juxtaposition of really hard rock with some cool moody choruses. The song is a great demonstration of both their hard rock and funk capabilities, and Chad's drumming is off the hook on this one. And when they get to that solo section, Flea, Chad, and John are completely on fire, adding a total live feel. And of course, the starter, Power of Equality, is a really heavy hitting tune, starting off with Hey, Batter, Batter, Hey, Batter, Batter, Hey, which is a typical taunt in a softball game. And the drum panning on this one's really interesting during the verses, especially where the kit is split between the left and the right speakers. Then you got Flea's bass holding down the groove right in the dead center. The chorus is catchy as all hell. And then for the breakdown, Flea gets all wild and crazy with the Ottawa effect, perfectly counterbalanced with some insane high notes from John. Very solid way to start off the album, for sure. And then there's Sir Psycho Sexy, which was basically a caricature of Anthony Kiedis that he wrote about himself. It's about a dude who can basically pick up any woman that he wanted, do whatever he wanted, 
but this song is probably the quintessential slow grooving chili peppers at their best. Anthony's lyrics on this one are hilariously shameless. Everything from creamy beavers to a really interesting story about being pulled over by a female cop and some interesting things happening as a result. Musically, the band is just so freaking locked in on this one. Flea's bass line is really interesting because he starts kicking in a slight bit of distortion and some Ottawa during parts, adding some variety and gnarliness to the groove. John's guitar slinks in right over the top of it with some funky wah, and the whole song just takes total change about the middle. Chad keeps that groove going strong while John and Flea take it in a different direction, different key, and then they just lock right back into the verse. And this one sounds like it was born from a jam, especially at the end where they go into some somber minor chords, which is completely unexpected. It's probably the trippiest song on the album, and musically it's perfect for those groove lovers. One interesting one, I Could Have Lied, was actually written by Anthony about his short-lived relationship with Sinead O'Connor. Another interesting fact about this album is that it actually dropped on the same day as Nirvana's Nevermind. Those in the know know how big Nirvana's album got, but nevertheless, this album fared extremely well. Since its release, it's actually gone seven times platinum in the U.S. Give It Away wasn't exactly a hit at first, and one of Warner Brothers radio stations wouldn't even play it, telling the band to come back when their song actually had a melody. However, there was a station in L.A., K-Rock, which started just playing the song over and over again every single day. And so Anthony was saying that's probably how the song ended up getting super popular. Of course, the band had no idea that Under the Bridge would end up taking off. And the reason that that was selected as a single was because Warner Brothers had actually sent people to a Chili Peppers show just to get an idea of what maybe they should release next. John Frusciante started playing the opening part of it, but apparently Anthony had forgot the words and he had just missed his cue. And it was at that moment that the whole crowd just jumped in and started singing it themselves. Of course, Anthony was embarrassed, especially being in front of the Warner executives. And so he apologized, but they were like, messing up? If the entire audience sings along to a song during a show, then it is a surefire hit. Under the Bridge blew up in January 92, reaching number two on the Billboard Hot 100. Anthony Kiedis and John Frusciante headed to Europe in order to give it an extra push. But the thing is, is that John Frusciante was having a hard time adjusting to the real world after being locked up in this mansion for almost a month. Anthony Kiedis had said that John was just so darn creative during the album that he seemed to struggle balancing kind of coming back to regular life after it was over. And of course, John started messing with H around that time. And by the time John and Anthony got to London, John said he was out. Around this time, Smashing Pumpkins came out with their song Rhinoceros, and Anthony had seen the video on MTV, so he reached out to their manager, asking if they might be able to make some room for the Smashing Pumpkins on the Chili Peppers tour. So a few days afterward, Jack Irons, who had actually played drums with the Chili Peppers, called up and asked if they'd let his buddy's new band, Pearl Jam, open for them on the road. So they had a hell of a crew going on, and it brought big crowds, with all sorts of craziness, including pogo dancers, people passing each other over their heads, stage divers, and it was a mixed crowd, not just a bunch of guys in a mosh pit. So the band was in the middle of their U.S. tour, right when the album was starting to sell like crazy. And the John Frusciante was really hoping that the band would stay more on the underground side of things, and he wasn't happy. Anthony was saying that John started losing his manic, happy-go-lucky fun side, and he really had this kind of brooding, serious vibe going on, even when they were performing. John was holding a grudge against the other guys in the group. He would just did not like the sudden fame. And during one show, things really got tense between Anthony and John. After a sold-out show in New Orleans, they had a heated argument. Because during that, John had just stood in the corner, barely playing his guitar. And of course, with Pearl Jam opening for them, the Chili Peppers were playing arenas, and the promoters actually thought that Pearl Jam wasn't a big enough name to back them up. So Anthony ended up reaching out to Dave Grohl from Nirvana, and Grohl agreed to have Nirvana fill in for Pearl Jam. But Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins wasn't having any of it, and this is because he had dated Kurt Cobain's wife, Courtney Love. So then Nirvana actually ended up replacing the Smashing Pumpkins, and Pearl Jam stayed on as the opening act. And Anthony Kiedis actually loved Nirvana, saying their music was like a chainsaw ripping through the night. He really liked their song choices and raw energy. And after wrapping up that tour, 
the Chili Peppers headed to Europe, and John Frusciante ended up taking his girlfriend, Tony Oswald, along for the ride. But the thing is, the band had this unspoken rule about not bringing wives or girlfriends on tour. And during that tour, they took a break to fly back to New York City in order to play on SNL. The band had played Under the Bridge as his second song, and John Frusciante was doing what he could to sync the song, starting off just noodling, not playing the intro, anything like how it was on the album. Anthony said that he just felt humiliated publicly. So the band ended up resuming their European tour, and then they were set for Japan, which started in May of 92. And right before the Tokyo gig, John Frusciante bailed, saying he was out. And this was right before the show was to start. So the band talked him into staying around, so he said, okay, fine, I will just do the show, but then that's it, I'm done. And so the Chili Peppers played, John stood there in one place the whole night, and barely got through the show, and then he was out. The Chili Peppers brought in Eric Marshall to play for the rest of the tour, which included Lollapalooza and a bunch of festivals in Europe and South America. The tour ended, and they gave him the boot. The Chili Peppers then tried to recruit Dave Navarro, but he said no. So they ended up bringing in Jesse Tobias. So Tobias started writing some new songs with them for their next upcoming album, but he was only in the group for a month, and Dave Navarro all of a sudden was available. So they gave Tobias the boot because they didn't feel that he fit with the band's chemistry either. But through all the weirdness and drama and everything else, the Red Hot Chili Peppers have some serious staying power, as they have proven over the past few decades. And Blood Sugar Sex Magic really stands as not only their real breakout album, but actually one of the most important albums that were released during the early 90s. So if you like what you see here, make sure you smack that like button while you're at it, hit subscribe and join the family. Thanks to all my subscribers for your inspiration and insightful comments. It's been motivating me to do more and more of these, and I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching.